and you are live. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ به من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم so inshallah we'll continue our series on the kitab ul fitan last week we discussed the first part of the story of dajjal and there are several issues today we'll be focusing only focusing on only a few ahadith these are very long ahadith so in the interest of the time i will skip the arabic part and go straight to the english translation but if anybody is interested these ahadith are present in sahih muslim as well as in the sunan of tirmizi as well so the first hadith that i want to talk about and i will go slow is from annawas bin saman who reported that allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam made a mention of the dajjal one day in the morning the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sometimes described the dajjal to be insignificant and sometimes described its turmoil as very significant and we the companions felt as if he the dajjal were in the cluster of the date palm trees what it means is that the description given by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was such that the sahaba ridwanullah alaihim ajmain faith thought that the dajjal was nearby very nearby so this was in the morning now they went to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the evening and they were obviously quite concerned and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam knew how to read the faces as well so he could see the signs of fear on their faces and he said what's the matter with you so the companion sirudwanullah ali majmain responded oh allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam you made a mention of the dajjal in the morning sometimes describing him to be insignificant and sometimes very important until we began to think as if we were present in some near part of the cluster of the date palm trees now at this the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said i harbor fear in regard to you in so many other things besides the dajjal what he's trying to tell them is that the dajjal is not so near but there are many other things that i am also worried about you now he continued by saying that if the dajjal comes forth while i am among you i shall contend with him on your behalf now this will be a very reassuring statement for the sahaba ridwan lai alai majmain as you can read it and if you were to read it in arabic you will realize it much more that they were really scared and now when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam reassured them that if the dajjal were to appear and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam was among them he will be the one who will deal with the dajjal but then he also mentioned but if he comes forth while i am not amongst you a man must contend on his own behalf and allah would take care of every muslim on my behalf and safeguard him against his evil so here if you look at it the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam being the leader of the community and being the last prophet it's he's taking it upon himself that if the dajjal were to appear he will be the foremost in fighting in containing with him and one can also sense that as we had mentioned earlier from different scholars including imam an-nawawi and sheikh modudi that the prophet sallam was given knowledge about the dajjal but he was not told by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the exact time of his appearance so now he saying that if the dajjal were to appear while the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not amongst the sahaba or he said among you now you can be interpreted as the sahaba ridwanullah alai majmain or you as members of his community members of his ummah then the responsibility would lie with the people they have to contain they have to defend themselves they have to stick with their iman and because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would not be there physically in this world allah subhanahu wa taala who is always alive who is always present will take care of every muslim on behalf of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam So now the Prophet Sallam <coughs> gave a description of the Dajjal as he has given in many other ahadith that the Dajjal would be a young man with twisted contracted hair and a blind eye. Now we have read different ahadith in some ahadith it is mentioned that his right eye will be blind or defective in others it's left and I gave you the compromise between the different descriptions given by different uh, scholars. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that I compare him to Abdul Uzza bin Qatan and then the prophet also mentioned that he who amongst you would survive to see him should recite over him the opening verses of surah kaf 
Now, I also mentioned to you the opinion of uh, Dr. Asrar Ahmed last week that in the entire Surah Al Kaf, not only Surah Al Kaf, but in the entire Quran, there is no mention of Ad Dajjal by name or even by description, if you look at it, the way it, he has been described in the Ahdis. So, one of the explanations given is, and I will expound, expound it further, inshallah, towards the end of this talk. The Surah Kaf has to do with the fitna of the Dajjal, the great deception. And so if people are passing through that phase, then they should recite the opening verses of Surah Kaf, as occurs in many Adis. But it can also mean that if the Dajjal were to come and we were to face him, we should recite the first 10 verses of Surah Kaf, which also means that every Muslim should try his or her best to memorize the first and also the last 10 verses of Surah Kaf, and preferably the entire Surah. So that the Dajjal would appear on the way between Syria and Iraq, and he would spread mischief from right and left. O servant of Allah, adhere or mean stick to the path of the truth. We, the companions with Wanullah Majmin, said, Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, how long would he stay on the earth? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi mentioned for 40 days. One day like a year, one day like a month, one day like a week, and the rest of the days would be like your days. Now, this becomes a very difficult and challenging task to explain it, but one should take it literally. Now, the Sahaba Ridwanullah Ali Majmain said something which is kind of astonishing. They said, Oh, Allah's Messenger وسلم, would one day's prayer suffice for the prayers of day equal to one year? Now, this highlights the importance of the Salah for the Sahaba Ridwanullah Ali Majmain. When the mention was made of the Jal staying for 40 days, one day will be like a year, one day like a month, and so forth, their concern was what will we do with our prayers? This is their concern. They were not talking about what shall we do with our business. That's an important thing to remember. And then the Prophet said, no, but you must make an estimate of time and then observe prayer. Now, this part of the hadith has been used by our fuqaha, our jurist, when they were asked the question of what shall we do, with, uh, uh, what sh how shall we pray on North Pole when it's day for six months and night for six months? And the answer was to make an estimate of the time and then observe the prayer. Now, the estimate of the time has also been translated as then calculate. I'm not going into the difference of opinion about the use of calculation in terms of the moon sighting, but this has this point has also been used. Now, the Sahaba Ridwanullah Alim Ajmain said, Oh, Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how quickly would you walk upon the earth? Thereupon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Like cloud driven by the wind. He would come to the people and invite them to a wrong religion. And they would affirm their faith in him. May Allah protect us and respond to him. He would then give command to the sky and there would be rainfall upon the earth and it would grow crops. Now, based upon such statements made in the ahadis, there are scholars who think that the Prophet ﷺ is actually not describing an individual, but he's describing a period of technological advancement where the people will be able even to produce rain in some way they should be able to master the forces of nature and bring about the rainfall upon the earth then allah knows best then in the evening the prophet ﷺ continues their pasturing animals would come to them with their humps very high and their udders full of milk and their flanks stretched what the prophet ﷺ is describing is a period of luxury a period of plenty he that is dajjal would then come to another people and invite them but they would reject him. So those will be the people who would recognize the great deception and they will not yield to it. Then the Dajjal would go away from them and there would be drought for them and nothing would be left with them in the form of wealth. Now you can apply to an individual performing some sort of a miracle. I don't want to use the word miracle, but some form of trick as a result of which people will be facing drought. It can also be that a superpower would prevent would dominate their country so much that the resources would be cut off from the people who really need them and they will be suffering. Either the Jal would then walk through the West land and say to it, bring forth your treasures. And the treasures would come out and collect themselves before him like the swarm of bees. Again, this could be a reference to 
technological advances to master the resources of the earth. It can also mean digging for oil and coming up with the oil. It could mean many things. He would then call a person brimming with youth and strike him with the sword and cut him into two pieces and make these pieces lie at a distance which is generally between the archer and his target. He would then call that young man and he will come forward laughing with his face, gleaming with happiness. And it would be at this very time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send Jesus, son of Mary, Maryam, uh, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, And he will descend at the white minaret in the eastern side of Damascus, wearing two garments, lightly dyed with saffron, and placing his hands on the wings of two angels. So this hadith is a clear-cut proof that Isa alayhi salatu wasalam would come back. Now, what about this trick of cutting a human being into two pieces and then bringing him back to life? It could be a physical phenomenon or it could be coming up with a technology of uh, cloning. The person could be cloned. As comes in uh, other ahadith as well, that the jal would bring a person and say, this is your father, this is your grandfather. This could be a reference to cloning. This could be a technology where you can say that a person who is in a state of suspended animation could be apparently brought back to life through technology. And Allah knows best. When he would lower his head, that is Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, there would fall beads of perspiration from his head. And when he would raise it up, beads like pearls would scatter from it. Every non-believer who would smell the odor of his self would die and his breath would reach as far as he would be able to see. What can also mean, this can also mean that there will be people who believe in Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, and there will be people who will not believe in him and they would die in some fashion. Then Isa alayhi salatu wasalam would search for him, that is the Jal, until he would catch hold of him at the gate of Lud and would kill him. Now there were Ahadis that we have studied previously that Umar radiallahu ta'ala no, wanted to kill a person known Ibn Sayyad in Medina. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told him that if Ibn Sayyad is the Dajjal, then you, o Umar, will not be able to kill him because it is Isa alayhi salatu wa salam who would kill him. So now then a people whom Allah had protected would come to Isa alayhi salatu wa salam, son of Maryam alayhi salam, and he would wipe their faces and would inform them of their ranks in paradise and it, it would be under such condition that Allah would reveal to Isa alayhi salatu wasalam these words. So now those are the people, remember in, the, uh, in this hadith, we have read about two different kinds of people. One pe group of people will be those who will believe in Dajjal, maybe not be among them. And then the second group will be those who will not believe in Dajjal because they will be able to see the deception. They will be suffering. But after Isa alayhi salatu wasalam comes back, he will kill the Jal and then he will give these people the good news and their ranks in paradise. May we be among those people if it happens in our lifetime. So now the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I brought forth from amongst my servants such people against whom none would be able to fight. You take these people safely to Tur, to tour, and then Allah would send Yajuj and Majuj and they would swarm down every slope. Min kulli hadibin yan saloon as the surah mentions. The first of them would pass the lake of Tiberias and drink out of it. And when the last of them would pass, he would say, there was once water there. Now, I've listened to some lectures on this hadith. There's also a mention of lake of Galilee instead of Tiberias, Allah knows best. That the water in the river, in the lakes, would dry out. Now, does it mean that there will be so many people that when the initial, the first people will be passing, they will be drinking, and by the, by the time the last people, the last group of people reach, the water will have completely been consumed? Or is it over a period of time that a time would come when the water of the rivers would run, the rivers would run dry? There will be no water left. Again, this is also possible. Isa alayhi salatu wasalam and his companions would then be besieged here at Tur and they would be so much hard pressed that the head of the ox would be dearer to them than 100 dinars, which means there will be there was such shortage of food. And the last messenger, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, 
and his companions would supplicate Allah, who would send to them insects, who would attack their necks, which means the necks of the enemies of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. And in the morning, they would perish like one single person. Allah's messenger, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, and his companions would then come down to the earth, and they would not find in the earth as much space as a single span, which is not filled with their putrefaction and stench, which means the dead bodies of the enemies would be putrefying and there will be smell all over and the entire land in front of them would be occupied by their bodies. Now Allah's apostle Isa alayhi salatu wasalam and his companions would then again beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who would send birds whose necks would be like those of Bactrian camels and they would carry them and throw them where Allah would will. So the bodies will be taken away by certain birds which will be very uh, large birds. Could it be a reference to uh, airplanes and Allah knows best then Allah would send rain which no house of clay or the tent of camel's hairs would keep out and it would wash away the earth until it could appear to be a mirror so now the cleaning part occurs that after the bodies have been taken away the earth will be washed with water with rain then the earth would be told to bring forth its fruit and restore its blessing and a result thereof there would grow such a big pomegranate that a group of persons would be able to eat that and seek shelter under its skin. And milch cow would give so much milk that a whole party would be able to drink it. And the milch camel would give such a large quantity of milk that the whole tribe would be able to drink out of that. And the milch sheep would give so much milk that the whole family would be able to drink out of that. And at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send a pleasant wind which would soothe people even under their armpits and would take the life of every Muslim and only the wicked would survive who would commit adultery adultery like asses in the last hour would come to them. So this is a highly descriptive hadith. We can take it on its literal sense or we can try and tease out that it could be referring to a very special type of period where there will be technological advances. At the same time, there will be aggression there will be countries who will be too powerful and that they would usurp the rights of other people. They would cut off their resources. And at that time, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam would come back, second coming of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, who would restore the order. And that would last for a period of few years. And thereafter, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam would die. And along with him, his followers would also die. And then the earth will be left with the wicked people who will be doing all kind of haram things and that will be very close to the last hour. Now there is another hadith narrated by Abu Sayyid al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu and uh, again I will read the English translation because of the scarcity of the time that Abu Sayyid al-Khudri reported that Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day gave a detailed account of the Dajjal and in that it was also included. So it's a big hadith and part of it is that when the Jal would come, he would not be allowed to enter the mountain passes to Medina. So he will descend or he will alight or he will reside in some of the barren tracks near Medina. And a person who would be the best of men or one from amongst the best of men would say to him, I bear testimony to the fact that you are the Jal, which means that person from the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be able to recognize the Jal and he would tell him that I testify that you are the Jal about whom Allah's Messenger وسلم, had informed us. Now, Dajjal would say to him that, what is your opinion? If I kill this person, then I bring him back to life. Even then, will you harbor doubt in this matter? They would say no, which means the people who are following Dajjal would say no, that if you are able to do this miraculous thing, we will have no doubt. He would then kill the man and then bring him back to life. When he would bring that person to life, he would say, by Allah, I know better proof of the fact that you are a Dajjal than at the present time. This is the statement of the person who has recognized Dajjal. That even after seeing a trick, he would again swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have no better proof of that fact that you are a Dajjal than at the present time that you are actually so. Because this person would remember the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Dajjal would then make an attempt to kill him again, but he would not be able to do that. Now, Abu Isaq, who was one of the narrators of this story reported that it was said that that person would be a khidr 
Now, in Arabic, it was said is qila. So I want you to understand two things which are often mentioned, two words in the books of Tafasir as well as in the explanation of the uh, books of Tafasir and Ahadith, qala and qila. Qala is when someone said and we know who said it. So it's a marifa. The speaker or the reporter or the narrator is known. Whereas qila is usually used when we don't know who said it or the person who made such a statement was not a very reliable person or a statement was made which majority of scholars did not accept. So qala and qila in Urdu we said qalo qil. They are different and uh, when you read these words you should be able to understand what they mean. Now Abu Sayyid al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala now also continues with a different hadith narrated by Imam Muslim that the Dajjal would come forth and a person from amongst the believers would go towards him and the armed men of the Dajjal would meet him and they would say to him, where do you intend to go? So that individual would say, I intend to go to this one who is coming forth. They would say to him, don't you believe in our Lord, which means the Dajjal? He would say, there is nothing hidden about our Lord. They would say, kill him. Then some amongst them would say, has your master, that is the Dajjal, not forbidden you to kill anyone without his consent? And so they would take him to the Dajjal and when the believer would see him, he would say, oh people, he is the Dajjal about whom Allah's Messenger وسلم, has informed us. The Dajjal would then order for breaking his head and utter these words, catch hold of him and break his head. He would be struck even on his back, on, on his stomach. Then the Dajjal would ask him, don't you believe in me? He would say, you are a false messiah. He would then order that person to be thrown into pieces with a saw from the parting of his hair up to his legs. After that, the Dajjal would walk between the two pieces. He would then say to him, stand, and he would stand erect. He would then say to him, don't you believe in me? And the person would say, it has only added to my insight concerning you that you are really the Dajjal. Now, this is different from the previous hadith where Dajjal would not be able to kill him. So he would then say, oh, people, he would not behave with anyone amongst two people in such a manner after me. The Dajjal would try to catch hold of him so that he should kill him again. The space between his neck and collarbone would be turned into copper and he would find no means to kill him. So now he had killed him the first time, but second time he will not be able to kill. Him. So we can say that the first hadith was a short one and this is the more detailed version. So he would catch hold of him by his hand and feet and throw him into the air. And the people would think as if he had been thrown in the hellfire whereas he would be thrown into paradise. Thereupon, Allah's Messenger said, he would be the most eminent amongst person in regard to martyrdom in the eyes of the Lord of the world. Now, Umm Sharik, uh, who was one of the Sahabia, asked the Prophet now when the Prophet said that, she said, the Prophet said, that yafir ranna nasi minat dajjal hatta yalaqo bil jibal, qalat Umm Sharik, qultu ya Rasulullah fa'anal arab yawmaizin. So Muslim has reported this hadith in which when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that people will be running away from the Dajjal until they reach the mountains, which means there will be no other option for them. And then Umm Sharik asked the Prophet ﷺ, where will be Arab? And he said there will be Qalil. Now Qalil can be in terms of the number or Qalil can be in terms of their strength. Both are possible. In another version, and hadith, Anas radiallahu ta'ala no mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ said, That the followers of the Dajjal will include 70,000 Jews from the Isfahan, and on top of them will be their leader. Now, Mughira bin Shoba has also reported as uh, one of the hadiths that no one asked Allah's Messenger ﷺ more about the Dajjal than I asked him. And he said, He should not be a source of worry to you, for he would not be able to do any harm to you. I said, Allah's Messenger وسلم, it is alleged that he would have along with him abundance of food and water. Thereupon, the Prophet said he would be very insignificant in the eye of Allah, even with all this. Now again, this can also apply to an individual. It may also apply to certain disbelieving nations that will be swimming in luxury, enjoying all kinds of benefits, being technologically advanced, being very economically very sound at the top of the world. But they would be insignificant in the eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this hadith is a hadith narrated by Fatima bin Taqayas, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And this hadith 
is actually a matter of uh, debate and discussion. So inshallah, I will talk about this hadith next week. It's a very long hadith and there are many issues which would require a lot of elaboration. So inshallah, we'll discuss this hadith next time. Aquli qali haza wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa la zikrullah akbar. Salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.